Paul has now emerged as the leader of the missionary outreach that has set out from the church at Antioch. On their journeys, they arrived at another place called Antioch. That was Antioch in Pisidia, different place, where they were then invited to speak. Naturally, Paul took that opportunity and so we have his first recorded sermon in Acts chapter 13. Last time, from that sermon, we looked at the subjects of forgiveness and justification by faith that it was raised there in Paul's first message. And we focused upon verses 38 and 39, remember? Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And so a glorious couple of verses that give us those wonderful truths that by my having faith in Jesus Christ, not only am I forgiven and cleansed of my sin, I'm made new, I'm accounted as righteous. I am justified of all things that the law condemned me for. That is the righteousness of Christ, righteousness of Christ is imputed to me. And thus before God, I'm accounted as innocent and as if I had never sinned. So right away, Paul has introduced these wonderful truths of forgiveness of sin and justification by faith. But it has to be pointed out again that this is only for those who truly believe in Jesus. For the Lord Jesus Christ is presented as the only way for men and women to be cleansed from sin and to be accounted before God as righteous. And so after preaching the sermon, we read in our text today, in just two verses, Acts 13, verse 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And I would like us to focus on the last part of verse 43, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And there are three things I'd like us to consider today. Persuaded them to continue, persuaded them to continue, <laughs> That's our first heading. Our second heading would be in the grace of God. They persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And then continuing on in the grace of God, to what end? Our third point then will be to our sanctification or growth in grace. So our first heading persuaded them to continue. It is one thing to preach the gospel and tell folks that the good news that if they believe in Jesus, their sins are forgiven. Through faith in Christ, you're going to be counted righteous. That's one thing. Then it's another thing to persuade them to continue, to keep going. You see, the Christian life is compared to a race. And in this race, one does not complete it after one lap. There's more than one lap. And it is the task of the pastor to encourage people to keep on keeping on. Now, how is one to persuade another to continue? Well, if you recall, you're reading John chapter 6, when everyone was leaving Jesus, his message had been a particular heavy one without going into great detail. He'd basically spoken to them about being fully committed unto him. And we read, and it's quite a coincidence that the verse that we read is John 6, 6, 6. I, I, the verses are not, the, the titles to the verses are not inspired. <laughs> they were put in there by the, the translator so we knew why to find it. When I tell you to turn to John 6, 66, you know where to turn. But it is quite interesting and it's quite a frightening verse. <laughs> <clears throat> 
From that time, many of the disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, let me persuade you to continue because there's nowhere else to go. (laughs) There's nowhere else to turn if you want eternal life. There's nowhere else you can find it. And no matter how your circumstances may change, how difficult the, the way may become, he'll still be the Christ, the Son of the living God. That doesn't change. It will never change. No matter what happens to us, no matter what happens in the world, that will never change. He will still be the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he will always be the one and the only one with the words of eternal life. I'm reminded of the parable of the sower, or the parable of, better called, I think, the parable of the soils. And in particular, the seed that fell on stony ground. It fell on stony ground and it sprung up immediately. Verse 5 of Mark chapter 4. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched because it had no root. And it withered away. And he explained who he was referring to. He said, these likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. They have no depth, but I am struck by the words, they have no root They have no root. See, it's so important that we put down spiritual roots. We put down spiritual roots in the Word of God, in the Bible, God's Word. It's important to take the Bible and realize that you need to immerse yourselves in it, to dig in deep, get firmly established, planted. And those who have no root may at first, you know, may be you know, entertained by or interested in or even thrilled by those that can deliver a good sermon. They may be excited by a message, but they do not dig in for themselves. And therefore, they never put down root in the Word of God. Let me quote Matthew Henry, an old commentator that I'm sure several of you have read, but let me quote him. He said this, God's word must be laid upon our heart that our thoughts may be daily conversant with them and employed about them and thereby the whole soul may be brought to abide and act underneath the influence and the impression of them. This immediately follows upon the law of loving God with all your heart. For those that do so will lay upon his word in their hearts, both as evidence and effect that love and as a means to preserve and increase it. And he said this, he that loves God loves his Bible. He that loves God loves his Bible. So you put down spiritual roots then in the Bible, in the word of God. Also, Put down roots in your local church. Put down roots in your local church. You know, I get, yeah, you're here. So it's kind of like preaching to the choir, as they say, or preaching to the already converted, as it were. But I do get somewhat disturbed. You see the empty seats and you see so many who profess Christ and never seem to settle on a church that they would call their home church. Some don't even bother at all, but then there are some that sort of flit around. They rotate. (laughs) They don't really put down roots in a local church. 
You need to commit yourself to a fellowship and get rooted there. It sort of used to be a common thing, uh, sort of taken for granted that a person that would call themselves a Christian would belong to, be rooted in, a local church. Sort of common thing, be a Christian, you're a church. It goes together. You're into it. A local church with a shepherd or shepherds. Pastors who would care for you. Care for the flock. You're the flock. You know, there are those people uh, well, you can turn on your TV or go to YouTube or wherever you do it online. You can find pretty much any Bible teacher you want to watch or listen to. Some a lot better than me. I mean, you could do David Jeremiah or whoever you want to. I mean, I think you'll probably still find some of Chuck Smith. You could do that. And there are those that do that. And they watch them and they watch them faithfully and say... That's my pastor. No, he's not. He's not. He's a speaker that you listen or you watch online. He has a flock. The people there can say, that's my pastor. Because the, the, the shepherd is watching over the sheep, the flock of God. He got to be in a local church. and yeah, You're already here, so... Get off it, Markham, that's it. <laughs> but I would add to the words of Matthew Henry, he said, he who loves God loves his Bible. I'd like to also say, he who loves God loves his church. So some are just not rooted in the word or they're not rooted in the church. And because of this, they only endure, as Jesus said, for a time. Do not last long. Like the flowers that take root in the shallow, rocky soil, so they soon shrivel up and die. I mean, the amount of people that come and go is astounding when you think of it. If all those people would find themselves a local church, or all people here in, on Merritt Island and Brevard, if they would find and commit to and be rooted in a local church, all the churches in the area would be full. The good ones anyway. There are some good ones. You see, afterward when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. So Jesus cites difficulties that come as a result of being a Christian as the cause for soon departure, for their soon departure. And notice he says, when tribulation comes, not if. When, not if. We certainly will face difficulties that are particular to our being a Christian. This world's not God's friend. And you believe in the Lord and follow the Lord is going to become your enemy also. If our experience of Christianity is a shallow one, then most likely we sort of naively think that we have no problems and now that we've become a Christian, everything's rosy, everything, and there are people online that you can watch that will tell you that, and they have really big churches. And they'll tell you that. Oh, it's wonderful. And not tell you the things I'm telling you today. You see, as well as not having immunity from the regular hardships and difficulties of life, we have the added challenge that comes from the enemy's opposition because we have received the Word of God into our heart. And the moment that we begin to show an interest in the Word of God, the devil will do whatever he can to dissuade us from such a pursuit. As Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation, but he said, be of good, he said, be of no fear, and be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. Don't be afraid of it. As a Christian, it is an absolute certainty that you'll face tribulation, even maybe persecution. As Paul wrote to Timothy, yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But it's just as certain that as he has overcome, we shall overcome. Follow him. I'm not going to start singing. We shall overcome. No. <laughs> you used to sing that song in church. Can you believe it? No. Just as certain as he is overcome, we shall overcome as we follow him. 
So we must not just begin, we must continue. And then it says, continue, continue in the grace of God. That's that second point, continue in the grace of God. We are saved by grace through faith. And it is in the grace of God that we continue. We're saved. We could not save ourselves. Grace was given that we might be saved. Well, the same grace is given that you might continue. That we might continue. And the Lord continues to minister his grace unto you and I as we continue. Enabling us to continue. I mean, we enjoy the fact that he has clothed us in his righteousness and we are accounted righteous before him. But what happens if we fail? After a genuine conversion, it it may be that we feel we never want to sin again. And for the sincere, committed believer who is serious about his faith, to fail and sin again can be sort of devastating. How can I continue on after I've failed my Lord? Well, you continue on in the grace of God. You discover that there not only is there grace enough to save you or grace enough to justify the ungodly, there is grace for the penitent believer who has failed. Written to believers. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is written to believers. Note what John writes. He says that God is faithful and just. God is faithful to that which he promised he would do through the sacrifice of Christ. And he is just when he forgives us, you see. In other words, when a person puts faith in Jesus Christ and all that he's accomplished for us on the cross, it is just and the right thing for God to do to forgive us. He forgives us in accordance to his justice. You see, as well as being a God of love, he's a just God. And the sacrifice of Christ not only is an expression of his love and his mercy for us, it also satisfies The justice of God. Look at John chapter 2 verse 1. John, 1 John chapter 2 verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So he wrote part of the scripture, the writing of, of the scriptures is so that we might not sin. And that's our desire, and that's God's ideal for our lives. Yet notice, there is an if. There's an if. And if anyone sins, we have a defending attorney. And so we can come to him, we can confess, we can be cleansed, we can be forgiven. So we are persuaded then to continue in the grace of God, And now, a word of warning when we talk about our third and final point. You see, to continue in the grace of God, to what end? And this point is very, very important to us. To sanctification or growth in grace. You see, to continue on in the grace of God does not mean Wow, God's grace covers me. It's okay for me to continue on in sin because grace covers it. That's an erroneous thinking. I once heard my my dear friend Don McClure say, faith in Christ and the resulting justification does not give a person a license to sin, but rather a power not to. You see, you cannot live, we cannot live our lives as though it really doesn't matter how we behave, what we do, what we partake in. Those who claim to be forgiven and justified and yet live a life of habitual sin without any concern, they're fooling themselves. 
fool themselves. And that is why we're told to continue on in God's grace. That is the proof, the proof that one is truly justified is in the continuing. Understand that. The proof that you are truly justified is in the continuing. The position we claim in Christ has to be evidenced by fruit or change. Something has changed about us. We're different now. We're now having been set free from sin, having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. It says being set free from sin. You're now slaves of God. You're no longer a slave to sin. We no longer have to be a slave to it. Prior to your salvation, you had no choice. People say, well, we've got free will. We've got, well, yeah, yeah, to a point. But you really had no choice. You, you were a slave to sin. I was a slave to sin. You were bound to sin. But with the forgiveness of sins comes then the work of the Holy Spirit to regenerate us, that is, make us new. We're new creatures. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And in coming to Christ, we are made new. We're set free. Oh, well, we may still sin. But we're not a slave to it. It's not our master any longer whom we have to obey. No. So we readily enjoy the forgiveness of sins, the doctrine of justification by faith, and so we should enjoy it. It's a marvelous truth. Marvelous to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. How wonderful that is. But we must learn this lesson. We cannot separate justification and sanctification as if you can have one without the other. Now I know they are theological words as it were but you cannot separate justification and sanctification you can't have one without the other let me remind you some of you have heard it before but let me remind you of the illustration I first heard from J. Edwin Orr wonderful Bible teacher he visited us at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa and wonderful Bible teacher he pointed out that says this blackness here is sin. Yeah, the black it's sin. I know it's a phone, <laughs> but that might be sin too. So um, it's black. Count. He was saying the black is your sin, and he he said he did give an illustration. He got his handkerchief, covered it, covered the blackness. Now you see, this is the righteousness of Christ. I'm covered when God looks at me, he doesn't see the blackness. He sees the robe of righteousness. He sees it clothed, the righteousness of Christ. But J. Edwin Orr said, and it just struck me when he said it, I went, whoa. He says, does anything happen to the blackness under the whiteness? Oh, oh. And he said, it better. It better. You see, it better. For if there's not a measure of sanctification growing in grace, then there's a question mark over one's claim of justification. Grace to continue is given in order that we might grow in grace. It's not given in order that we might just live however we want to live. Oh, I'm covered by God, grace. No, the grace is given in order that you might grow in grace. You're justified that you might be sanctified, you see. So we have evidence that we've been justified. We're growing in grace. We're experiencing then what we term progressive sanctification, growing in grace. But if one's life does not evidence one's claim, then the claim is invalid. If someone says, I'm justified by faith, and covered by Christ's robe of righteousness, yet without any measure of sanctification, or the blackness is not going away at all, is not changing at all, no sanctification, or no growth in grace, that person is either deceived 
or deceiving themselves. And if there's no change, if today a person is no more Christ-like than the first day they professed Christ, if there's not been any growth, no sign of any sanctification whatsoever, how can that one ever claim that their justification is real? I repeat, that one is deceived or deceiving themselves. We said the Christian life is likened to a race of more than one lap. And to know that you're justified, you need to keep running it. Keep running it. Continuing. Keep on keeping on. But not only is it likened to a race, it's also likened to a a farmer who plants in a field. He expects to see what he planted grow. And then he, he looks for fruit from that which he's planted. He, he looks for leaves, new leaves, new shoots, a harvest of fruit. Why? To show that the tree's alive. There's an interesting section in James. We've got a few minutes left. Let's have a little Bible study. This is a little Bible study now, okay? In James and in Romans. Uh, We're going to consider James chapter 2, verse 24, along with Romans 3, verse 28. And as I read them, you go, they contradict each other. Well, let's read it. Romans 3, verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And then James chapter 2, verse 24. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone only. Many people have had a problem with this. Even the Protestant reformer, Martin Luther, he had a problem with it. He called the book of James an epistle of straw. (laughs) He was wrong. It's just as much scripture as the book of Romans is scripture. So how can you reconcile these verses? First of all, when you study scripture, you don't do what I just did. Take verses out of context. No. You must look at the context, the content, the intention, and the local application. You read all of the book and you discover what the author's purpose was. When you're studying it, what was he saying? Who was he saying it to? What did he set out to achieve? What was he trying to accomplish? Now I am convinced that Paul and James both believed the same thing. But the letters were written from different perspectives, with a different objective. What is Paul showing? He says, our works under the law, we're not going to save you. It can't be nothing in salvation. Can't be saved by it. Can't be saved by good deeds. What's James showing? Well, he's addressing a completely different issue. People taking faith or believing the wrong way. Not real faith. He says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he does not have works? Can faith save him? In other words, can that kind of faith save him? It's as though he's saying the kind of people who say they believe, it's not real heart faith, or what we call saving faith. They believe, and they also believe, though, that whatever they do, doesn't make any difference. You can live however they want to live. They believe you can be saved by just saying it or saying a prayer, asking Jesus into your heart and then go live however you want to live. We call that easy believerism. They don't have faith. They may have it intellectually. They may intellectually assent to these truths, but that's no good. Because what does James say? <laughs> the shock of this is he, He must have been shocked at people when he first told them this. He said, you believe in God. You believe there's one God. All right. Fair enough. You do well. Even the demons believe (laughs) and tremble. Not enough to say you believe. True heart faith brings a change. It's fruit. So he concludes in verse 24. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. So James is referring to a belief that has nothing to do with real faith. He's talking about those that that don't have a real faith. 
that real faith is more than hearing and acknowledging truth, more than even believing and accepting it. It is that vital element of commitment and abandonment to it. James was concerned. He was concerned for people who had separated these elements of faith. He was concerned that they would not receive false assurance. How many people in these huge churches that never teach these things, that never preach these things, how many of them have false assurance? Charles Finney called it false comfort. How many religious people in the United States of America have this false assurance that James was so, uh, he so wanted that these people didn't, would not have that false assurance. He did not want them to be deceived. So James is referring to kind of a pseudo-believing that's not real heart faith. And when Paul speaks of faith, he takes for granted that we all know he's talking about real heart faith. And Paul says in verse 28 of chapter 3 of Romans, Therefore we conclude a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. We could paraphrase that. Saying he's justified by heart faith, saving faith, genuine faith. There's no contradiction between these verses. Paul's teaching faith has nothing to do with works under the law. James is insisting that people that you see the faith that, that you de- manifest and demonstrate is saving faith. And it's faith that saves, but is evidenced by a person's life, the fruit, the works. It's more than an intellectual ascent. Yes, faith comes first, but works always follow. And someone has given that illustration. It's a simple one and a little corny, but he said that faith is like the locomotive that pulls along the carriages of works, of good deeds, of fruit. And so those who claim to have uh, been forgiven and are justified by faith Yet they continue on a life of sin, thinking all is all well, because, well, I'm forgiven, I'm justified of deceiving themselves. We cannot play games with the grace of God. Cannot play games with the grace of God. So, brothers and sisters, let me persuade you to continue on in the grace of God. You see, brothers and sisters, there's enough grace for all. There's enough grace to continue to grow in grace. There's enough grace for all of us. There's grace enough for all of us, even all of our failures. There's grace enough for all of us to grow. You say, well, I'm new. I don't know very much. I've only just started to read the Bible and I'm afraid I'll mess up. There's grace enough. Well, I've been at this a a while now. I've seen some changes in my life, but I still feel like I've got a long way to go. I still mess up. There's grace enough. I've been saved a long time, but I'm ashamed to say I still struggle with my flesh. and Sometimes I succumb. There's grace enough. There's grace enough for the one who will humbly come to Christ with a contrite heart. Amazing grace has saved a wretch like me. Although it's not in the lyric of the song, I would add amazing grace that keeps a wretch like me. (laughs) And when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So my dear brothers and sisters, let's be persuaded to continue on in the grace of God, continue in His Word, continue in fellowship at your local church that you might grow and continue to grow in the grace of our Lord that each and every day you're becoming more and more like your Lord Jesus. As you grow in grace, you're becoming more and more like Him. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for these truths. Thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters here today who, Lord, are walking with you. I pray that each and every one of us, Lord, 
Uh, I know we're all at different stages of our maturity or of our life. But Lord, I pray whatever stage we're at, we might still be going and running the race. We might be going one more lap. We might be continuing on. And that, Lord, we know that as we do, we should finish that race. And we should give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.